We have so much to get through today, from DNA sequencing to computer compression algorithms and economy-crushing dollar values, and my first pass at this video was over 25 minutes long, so let's just skip the shenanigans and get started. How on earth does the Pokemon PC storage work? <laughs> In order to begin even answering the PC storage system problem, we are going to have to agree to some ground rules because otherwise this isn't going to be a single video, it'd be a running series of videos and a brand new show called Austin Spends Two Years of His Life Overthinking Pokemon. Okay, so number one is we're not going to touch on precisely how Pokeballs catching Pokemon and releasing them from the Pokeballs works. I might have some jokes at the end about this, but that's well outside the scope of this this video. Number two, because every iteration of the Pokemon storage and transportation system is called a PC, we will be assuming that the storage system is a computer, since in Japan it's called, well, the personal computer, it looks like a computer, and it is obviously a computer, and in several versions it has stuff like email in it. It is a computer, just look at it! I bring this up because, in all honesty, the simple answer I had originally was just, hey, the computer is just the interface, you put your Pokeball in the hole, and it sucks it up like one of those bank teller tube things and deposits the ball in some central storage facility in the middle of the region, which, yeah, would be awesome, but that is not what we're here to talk about today. So, first of all, what is a Pokemon? A Pokemon is essentially an animal, just like you, me, my cat, my dog. They have magic powers, which is a bit weird, but we're gonna be mostly ignoring that for now. So, what is an animal? Well, an animal is a collection of organs that are fused together into a specific arrangement. And what are organs? They're a collection of cells that individually perform very specific tiny functions that all add together into a very complex set of functions that are all bound together with glycocalyx intercellular cell adhesion molecules. A cell is the basic building block of life as we know it on this planet. There's a lot going on inside a cell, but the main important part we need from it right now is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. This is the stuff we are really after because it contains everything that makes an animal itself. DNA is a complex, long molecule composed of a long, double helical chain made of smaller sections called nucleotides, all strung together in a row and in pairs. And these pairs are called base pairs. And here I'm in a bit of a pickle. This script got really long because I went into a comprehensive dive about how to store DNA, cell data, and the brain. And here's the problem. DNA? It takes up almost no space on a hard drive, seriously. At its biggest estimate, it's about 6 gig for the human genome if you store it in 8-bit characters. But in a proprietary storage format, you could use as little as 1.5 if it used 4 bits per base pair, of which there's 3 billion in the human genome. It would use 4 bits because 4 bits in binary lets you cover all 16 combinations of G, T, A, and C, the four different nucleotides that make up base pairs. It's all incredible incredibly cool science, but if I'm being honest, the storage requirements barely make a dent in our storage needs. DNA is just really easy to store as data. That's, that's it. I did, however, leave a link to my cut sections from the video that are mostly contextless, so you can give them a read if you want, because uh, it's still really neat stuff. All right. So, 1.5 to 6 gig to store DNA, and now it is time to get to the really hard stuff. So, we've accounted for the basic instructional code that our Pokemon cells are going to need, DNA, but let's zoom out again on that what makes an animal an animal thing. Organs, which are made out of cells. See, DNA can't account for me getting sick for two weeks and losing five pounds, nor can it account for a machoke hitting the gym, or heck, getting a broken arm or an amputation, or years and years of education, which we will get to later, no! Our cells are important parts of our bodies that change dynamically based on our experiences and our choices, and so when you store that EV trained skiddo in the PC, if all you're storing is the DNA, the only thing that's gonna plop out when you come back to get it is a generic wild skiddo with no EV points. You need those muscles to show, which means we're gonna need to store that in 
information too. This is a bit trickier to quantify. See, DNA actually is information. So it's easier to be like, this is a bit and a bite or whatever. All the cells in your body though? Uh, <laughs> I struggled with that one for quite a bit. Ah, quite a bit! I didn't even think about that. But I think I came up with a pretty solid method for finding the amount of storage you would need. Fermi estimation. We've gone over Fermi estimation before, but it's a way to get ballpark estimates that get you pretty close to a real answer based on limited information. It's named after Enrico Fermi, who used falling sheets of paper during atomic bomb tests to estimate blast yields. The general idea is that if you have some information to go off of and you make enough estimates, your overestimates and underestimates will kind of average each other out and you'll get within the ballpark of the right answer. Fermi estimated that a 21 kiloton bomb was 10 kilotons from those sheets of paper, which is either a terrible estimate or an amazing one, depending upon how you look at it. If I'm off by half in this case, I think I'm going to consider it a win. So the human body actually lets use a human-like Pokemon. Machoke is pretty close. Uh, peak himbo, maybe. But uh, anyway, the human uh, uh, Machoke body has 30 trillion cells in it. Let's uh, double that. 60 trillion. Nah, uh, double it again. There we go. I feel good about that. 120 trillion. Let's say it takes 120 trillion bytes to store cell data. That may not all be individual cells. It could be groups of similar cells. If it's a simple enough system like muscles or bones, that amounts to uh, 120 terabytes. Oof. <laughs> that is uh, slightly worse than the 1.5 gig. Uh, see why I ended up skipping DNA? This is not going to fit onto a thumb drive at the time this video is coming out. But I'm sorry to disappoint you, Yugi. You've activated my trap card. Computer science and data compression. So data compression is absolutely incredible, and even after reading about it for days and trying my hand at it manually, and that's right, you heard me, manually, I've learned to appreciate data compression a lot. Not for the computer chicanery I thought it was, but for the mathematical and processing genius that it actually is. You see, cells in your body and DNA too are perfect candidates for data compression, especially DNA. We're gonna go over the basics of how data compression works it's not the actual algorithms themselves, so you can get a sense for how powerful and not magical it actually is. Data compression looks for repeating patterns and uh, makes them shorter. Take this sentence for example. I took a quick pass at it and compressed it from 206 characters down to 134 using a series of replacements that will reference a library of patterns that match to the points upon decompression and put those patterns back in. Of course, the library takes up space too, so all said and done, I only compressed it by 10.7%, but that's not bad for a non-computer. And the fact of the matter is, short little sentences like this are generally very difficult to compress by very much at all. But longer sequences, like sequences that are filled with a lot more characters, they have a lot more patterns to find. And bodies? Bodies have a lot of patterns. You got muscle cells repeating over and over down your arm until they reach your elbow. It's all patterns. In fact, just like human development is one big pattern repeating itself. That's what growth is. Oh, we need more bones. Hit that button that makes the bone 3D printer go. And DNA? DNA is filled with patterns. There's only four different molecules to work with, and a lot of them are highly predictable, especially within the same species. An algorithm designed specifically to compress DNA data could be made easily by people way smarter than me, in all honesty. And the best part about these compression methods is that they are totally totally lossless, which means you lose no information at all. This is opposed to compressions like JPEG and MP3, and even this video that you're watching, which was uploaded as an MP4, where a little bit of data is always lost and can't ever be gotten back. However, this is not the type of compression you want to use for things like DNA and cell information because it will lead to mistakes. Like, what's just aberrations and artifacts and a JPEG around the edges? Yeah, yeah, that's cancer. That's your pancreas not doing uh, whatever a pancreas does. That's your eyeballs being filled with stomach acid instead of aqueous humor. So, yeah, there's no taking this 120 terabytes and 1.5 gig down to like 20 gigabytes or something, but we can do pretty darn good regardless. As far as DNA data goes, I actually wrote a quick little script in 
Python that was meant to generate sample DNA code to use for demonstrative purposes, and, uh, it's probably the worst thing I've ever written. Okay, no, the Bulbasaur thing is the worst thing I've ever written, but it took, like, hours and hours. Probably should have used a string append or something to avoid so many write commands. Oh, well! Anyway, it broke at about 2.79 gigabytes, which at UTF-8 bit encoding of one byte per character gives us about 1.4 billion base pairs, less than half my target, but it'll suit its purpose, which is to illustrate just how well even random DNA-like text can be compressed without losing a single thing. I did a few basic compressions, and none did better than WinRAR compressing into the RAR format. I'm sure some super pro-level stuff could have done better, but even this basic tool was able to take this 2.79 gig and compress it down to 740 megabytes. That's over 74% compression. You must be saying to yourself, there must be a trade-off. If compressing is so efficient for storage, why isn't everything compressed losslessly? And the answer to that question is actually pretty easy. There is a cost, and the cost is processing time. This file took about 3 minutes to compress and 2 minutes and 44 seconds to decompress. That adds 5 minutes, almost 6, to anything you want to do to it, like open it and read its contents. That is the cost, the trade-off. All magic comes with a price. In any case, taking this same compression ratio and using it on our DNA and cell and organ data, we can take this 120 terabytes and squash it down all the way to just 30 terabytes. All right, so there, we did it. 30-ish terabytes for your average Pokemon. Are we done yet? Not even close! Because we left out the most important part of the equation, the brain. Sure, you can argue that the cell data was enough to track this, but I don't think so. Not by a long shot. Even rudimentary brains are still some of the most powerful singular computing systems on the entire planet. And while we don't have to emulate the processing power of a brain in the computer, we do have to save the memories, skills, and experiences of a Pokemon perfectly. Modern estimates put the human, I mean, I mean Machoke brain at about one petabyte of storage capacity. That is astronomical. That is 1,000 terabytes. That that means even with 74% compression, heck, even with 80% compression, you're looking at 200 terabytes plus the 30 from the cell and tissue data plus 360 meg of the DNA. You're looking at conservatively bare minimum 230 terabytes and 360 meg required to store a single Pokemon. And that's just like a dumb one like Machoke. Does it get worse than that? Oh yeah! It gets a lot worse. Because some genius at Game Freak wrote down that Alakazam's the final evolved form of Ab have an IQ of 5,000, making them 50 times more brain smart than the average himbo, human, or machoke. This boosts the brain storage requirement to 10,030 terabytes and 360-ish megabytes. That's 10 petabytes compressed. That much has to be available for one Pokemon. One! It'd take the world's fastest ever recorded data transfer speed of 319 terabytes per second over five minutes to upload this bad boy. And on top of it, there's 240 slots available in Gen 1 alone, and all the way up to a thousand in games like Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu, meaning that these boxes, these PCs, they have to be capable of storing anywhere between 2,000 and 400 petabytes to over 10,000, even with data compressed. That's 10 exabytes, which is approximately 0.4% of the entire storage capacity available in the world in 2020. 21, which is estimated to be about 22 to 2300 exabytes. This is for one person that has to be available. It gets worse when you consider an entire world of Pokemon trainers. Generation 1 alone sold 46 million copies if, conservatively, they had enough storage space for all those people to fill their boxes with Alakazams, which is likely an underestimate considering the population of the world in 1997 was 5.8 billion and the entire world economy seems to center around Pokemon if all these players filled their boxes with compressed Alakazams, the PC data center would have needed over 110 million exabytes of storage space, which at 100 bucks per gigabyte, which was the going rate for storage in 1997, would have cost over 11 quintillion dollars to build in 1997 money. That's 19 quintillion bucks today. If you add up all the people who bought all the games, you get 220 million and with their associated box sizes, you get a total storage for all the boxes ever made, all filled with Alakazams of 1.3 
billion exabytes of storage needed to store at maximum capacity, all of which has to be available on a dime. That's so much storage required that we don't even have a word for it yet. It's 1,311 yottabytes. And the term for 1,000 yottabytes has two proposed names, Hellabyte and Brontobyte. I'm personally a fan of Hellabyte because it's a hella of a lot of bytes. It's definitely more storage than I will ever see in my lifetime. I might, might live to see a petabyte hard drive in my home. In the modern day, to store one normal Pokemon, a Machoke, it would take 12 Western Digital 20 terabyte My Book Duo desktop RAID external hard drives to store, and it would cost you just shy of $9,000. That's the cheapest, but if you're using a data center, which values the terabyte on average at about 750 bucks, you're looking at more like 172.5 thousand per Machoke. These values skyrocket to 376.4 thousand to 7.5 million for an Alakazam. For one, a full box of Gen 1 is between 90 million to 1.8 billion. Raise that to 7.5 billion if you can store 1,000 like in the Let's Go games. The cost of being able to store the worst case scenario number of Pokemon, that 1.3 helibytes from all the games, that'd be 983 quadrillion dollars, which is cheaper than the storage costs of Gen 1 alone in 1997. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because storage prices have dropped by a lot since 1997. This is still way more money than exists in the entire world right now, like period. End of story. And all of this ignores how on earth you convert a Pokemon into storable data anyway. Is this what Pokeballs are doing? Is that why it's so hard? They're trying to tear Pokemon apart at a molecular level to get their genetic information and count their cells, unravel their brain to store it all in some sort of compressed format, and then at launch decompress it all again? That is a really dark interpretation for why the powerful Pokemon are much more difficult to catch. They're harder to decode and read the data from, and the process of ripping their cells apart and then putting them back together again just uh, you're not going to convince me that that does not hurt they're in the pokeball for seconds not milliseconds they probably feel all of that every cell in their body being ripped free and scanned so it can be stored in the giant freaking hard drive that's somewhere in there that's gonna be a yikes for me dog sincerely austin Oh my god, I made it. Oh, I've been so sick the past two weeks. I made it through this video, barely. Oh my god, I'm so tired. And because I made it here, I have to thank my high tier patrons who make this show possible. Those people are gonna be Juan Santa Maria, Mad Lad 616, Miss Kendra, Ronald Coleman, Adeline Hagers, Adam TP, Nicholas Belinger, Marissa Resnick, Nick Patterson, and Loretta Mazur. Oh, I made it. Holy cow. Oh, don't have kids unless you're ready to get really sick in wintertime and fall time. Because woof. Wasn't even COVID. Just kick my butt.